For Zootopia, I think the, the thing that um, I find the most moving about the film is that in this world of animals where animals are so different from one another, those things that are common, it's where they find that connection, where they find, okay, well, you're not so different from me. You may look different than me. We may have been brought up differently, but in the end, we all care about the same things, and we, we all deserve the respect that we want from each other. We all deserve to be happy in our lives. We deserve love, we deserve equality, and that's why I think these movies can be so powerful, because they are modern fables. We're able to talk about things that are very, very difficult, and uh, we're able to bring, I think, uh, into conversation things that are kind of awkward to talk about, but that's, that's, that's what the film is about. I'm Byron Howard, I'm the director of Zootopia, and I've been on this project for four and a half or almost five years now. We have about 500 to 550 people working on this film at any one time. And the people who are on this journey the longest with me are Rich Moore, I'm directing the film with Rich, and Rich created Wreck-It Ralph, he's a great, amazing director. Jared Bush, my creative partner, he's our co-writer and co-director, brings a great sense of humor and a great screenwriting sensibility to the film. And then uh, Josie Trinidad and Jim Reardon, our heads of story, and those guys work with us to craft the story and uh, make sure that we're staying on track. And finally, Clark Spencer, who is a longtime friend of mine. He's been my producer on several films, and Clark is a great producer because there can be chaos and hellfire all around you, yet Clark can still somehow make it seem okay. Thousands of years ago, the world was a different place. A place where everybody was naked. Zootopia will be Disney Animation's 55th animated feature. It's this amazing all-mammal city where things seem like they're perfect. It's the perfect city. It seems like nothing could be better. And our story is about two of these animals, a rabbit and a fox, that come together across the animal divide and have this amazing adventure throughout the city. It all started on Zootopia when Byron and I shared with each other our love of the type of Disney movie, Disney animated film where the, it's animals and they're walking upright wearing clothes. Byron has always loved animal movies. Um, I think one of the earliest ones he, he talks about a lot um, is Robin Hood. It's just so charming how animals and the scales of them are all different and they're all wearing clothes. And I love that kind of world. And I thought, you know, we have not made one of those kind of movies, um, you know, in a long time. So before we dove into the story headlong, I sent the teams off to do research in this. Five years, I think so. We are in the Animation Research Library, which has millions of pieces of artwork from all of our animated films, all the way back to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which was the first animated feature that Walt did. This is the core of the Disney legacy. Uh, this is the source from which everything else springs the source of inspiration for even television animation and, and various uh, other animation productions. So you could walk in in any given vault on any given day for any given project and open up a box and be surprised. So what I love about coming here, Fox, is that every day is like Christmas because you've got a box full of stuff <laughs> that I want, that I want to see. So what do you have in here? Here we go. Ah, oh, okay. Robin Hood. All right. It's amazing to see this in person, just because I've seen this, I grew up on this movie. And Zootopia, I think, is here in part because of this film, and it really felt like if we were gonna do this, we have to get the research right, we have to make sure we know what we're talking about, just like these guys knew. Like, they brought in real animals for Bambi to study, and, and since you, if you know that stuff, then you can go to the next level and really caricature it and bring it to life and make it something that's beyond reality. They are... We really believe that the best stories come from real research. And uh, we've already been on research trips to New York and Las Vegas and Florida to Animal Kingdom, but to actually get to go to Africa and see these animals that we're portraying in the movie in the, in the wild. So here we are in Kenya. 
We have the whole Zootopia leadership team uh, here to do research to make the movie better and more immersive, and I, I couldn't be more excited to be here. The information that we get and the feelings that we get from this research, research trip will be felt throughout the film. The nice thing is that every person who represents a different um, department here is looking for something different. The soil, the, the color palette of the soil, to, to, the, to the grass, to the trees, to the thorns. They're looking at, looking at how the light is playing with, with something this big on scale. The mountain is from the next valley, from the plains that are in front of us. The cloud formations, the cloud shadows moving across the landscape. There's so much to see here. It's, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. You look down and you see, you know, a place where all the animal, all the animals' trails come together to cross a river, and then they all spread out again. And there's this really rich red earth that's, that's really beautiful. So we're going to imitate kind of like that feeling of, of animal trails leading to a waterhole. It's been great to see how the different animals interact with each other, and to see them, how at the watering hole, a place where they all gather. Colors are so different from every animal, especially elephants here behind us. Like some are dark, some are really red, some are gray. We talked a lot about um, those babies. There's so many little children animals around, and so I think that's going to really change the landscape of our movies, thinking about how many baby animals to bring in there. We're going to have to look into some of our design. I don't think you can actually animate the mouse shapes the way we need to. People are probably not going to be super happy when we get back. There's a lot that we want to change, but <laughs> we'll see what we can do. It needs to be perfect. At some point, you uh, there's this nice transition where you went from trying to like I'm here to work, and then I'm really taking everything in, and you're, just, you're in a weird way by not looking for what the work equivalents are and just sort of uh, experiencing it. I think for a lot of us. That's where you got the most sort of interesting nuggets that you needed for the movie. People wonder why we do these research trips and why Disney spends so much time in research, but it's this stuff that you can't really put your finger on. Like, you would never know about any of this stuff before you went, but once, you, once you're there and you experience this stuff, then it kind of it works its way into your system and you bring it back with you. And, and then people uh, who you're communicating with on the show can then take their, uh, their work to the next level. And that's, that's been amazing. When I first came here, uh, a little over th three years ago, uh, at the time, uh, the movie was uh, an all-animal world. In the first act, the, uh, you were done with the animal world, and then you went to this sort of fantasy island where the bulk of the movie took place. And early on, uh, Byron got a lot of notes saying, hey, that first, that city is so cool. What if we make the whole movie within that city? And so I was really, really lucky and excited to come in right as Byron was reconceiving what an all-animal city version of this movie could be. Right now, the filmmaking is broken into two parts, you know, that overlap a little bit. There's development, you know, where that's kind of planning the story, writing the script, you know, beginning storyboarding, and then there's production, you know, and that's the actual kind of making the movie. It's interesting because when they start out with the idea, everyone's excited about that idea, but you don't know how long it's gonna to take to take that original idea and flush it out into a full story. At the same time, the story is happening, we have visual development, and visual development is a team of artists that are really trying to look at what is this world gonna look like. We have modelers who come in and they build those models for the buildings and for the characters. And then we have riggers come in that give us the ability to actually move those characters and those buildings around to create the shapes. And then from rigging, it goes into look. And we actually have a team of artists who put the fur on the characters and the cloth on the characters or put the look on the actual buildings. And then from look, it goes into cloth simulation because we have to have people thinking about how is that cloth going to move. And then we actually start building the shots. We have a layout team that is placing a camera into the shot to see say, where, what angle am I going to shoot it at? And once that camera's placed, we go to animation, and animation starts to actually move those characters around. And then finally, lighting comes in, and lighting puts that pass on that they're actually lighting the characters in a way that makes that shot come to life. These aren't 
just cartoons to us. They're real films, they're real stories. And so we start to think about these characters like real human beings, like they have a soul and they have a, a life to them that really um, makes them make key decisions that guides them through the story. My name is Corey Loftus, and I'm the character design supervisor. My favorite characters in Zootopia are definitely our two main characters, Nick and Hops. They're my favorites not only just because they're fantastic characters, but because they were the most challenging, and uh, they need to go all, through all of these different emotions because we really want them to feel like real animals and not, not animals that we forced human characteristics onto. And then at some point, the animators come along, and we work with the designer, kind of go back and forth on what would work good for animation, and modeling says what would work good for them. And, and we all kind of work together to come up with this package, which is this character. These were expressions that our uh, character designer, Corey Loftus, did. And then I will try to match these as close as possible. I describe it as like we're shy actors, but we actually get to, you know, sort of craft the performance. And we don't have to perform it live like an actor does in front of the camera or on stage. So we really get the time to kind of think about like what's going on inside the character's mind and, and try to find the best way to convey that. You need your audience to believe that this character is living and breathing, like literally living and breathing. And if they're just going through the motions, if there's just uh, emotion attached to a piece of dialogue, that even, even, at, even if it's somebody who doesn't know anything about animation, they, they see it, there's something not quite registering. And I think that's the tricky part is, you literally have to trick the audience into seeing, or not seeing, the animator's hand. Mammals were divided into two groups. Predators with the sharp teeth, and prey with the flat teeth. And why weren't we friends? Mmm, finnick. Cause we wouldn't share. Close. Because predators would eat us. In this world, predator and prey have figured out a way to live and coexist in the same city. But what we're gonna find out is that coexistence isn't as utopian as you might think. There is truly a problem in this city, and that is the fundamental part of the story that gets to this idea of bias, about two groups that assume something about somebody else. In the beginning was this place that, that the prey kind of, the prey animals ran it, and um, the predator characters were kind of, um, um, subservient to the prey. We thought about this movie as, is this movie about instinct? And it's about predators overcoming their instinct. But very quickly, we started realizing, no, this is about bias, because we've said those things don't exist anymore for this group. And once we got talking about bias, then that really, I think for us, we went, whoa, this, this movie could really say something. It's a great, difficult subject to talk about, and uh, it's something that having an all-animal world is great for it because it becomes sort of this 21st century fable where you can really talk about bias as a difficult human subject. And it was really one of the things that drew me into wanting to produce this movie was this idea of talking about bias in a modern way because bias is something that is universal. It exists everywhere around the world. But there is a place where opportunity, diversity, and justice shines bright. A city called Zootopia! Everything we do at animation is in service to story. Every lighting decision we make, every emotion that we play out on screen is all in service to telling a better story. And that's what makes story so difficult. That's why we spend years developing the script and screening and rescreening these films, because if your story isn't working, then the most beautiful shots in the world, the most beautiful animation won't save that film. The head of story uh, manages a team of about 10 story artists, and we work really closely with directors and the writer. And we basically take the movie from the script, this words on a page, and we thumbnail it out, and we turn those words into visuals. This, to me, is my acting. 
I'm acting on paper. Boom! He gets hit by a car, and this squirrel driver goes, aye! And the nuts go tumbling across the street, and Nick lands there, and whoop, whoop! And then you start this traffic ticket. So I think, I mean, that's a version. <laughs> if it sticks, I, I don't know. I hope it does. It's actually, it's funny. When you're a storyboard artist here at Disney, you have to be comfortable with your work getting thrown away. All of us um, who board, who storyboard in this movie, have done literally thousands of drawings that have wound up in the garbage because these ideas come in and they go out of the films very, very quickly. And the, the idea with that is to be wrong as quickly as possible. So we really try to, you know, try out as many ideas as we can. And then when the right ideas uh, really click in, then you'll see from screening to screening, they'll start to build, uh, the rest of the film will start to build around those key ideas. It doesn't have to be very many, but just a few that kind of hold up the structure of the film where you can really lock into like, okay, that's your character, that's your movie, and then everything else builds from there. When we make movies like this, um, we, we um, screen them repeatedly as we're making them. Uh, not, not to like the general audience, but to, to ourselves, you know, to the people working at the studio, to colleagues, to the people up at Pixar, uh, the filmmakers there, and as a, a way of kind of checking ourselves to make sure that we're making progress, you know, with the story. Tomorrow we screen version number five of the movie, and that means basically we've already looked at it four times. Tomorrow is the fifth version of it. And the way it works for us is those first versions are really us testing out ideas and learning about the characters. And so there's pressure to make sure your story is evolving and your characters are landing, but the real pressure starts tomorrow because that's when we actually start to put things into production, which means you have to start cementing those ideas in a way that they're not gonna change because you don't wanna push something forward into the hands of the cinematographer or into the hands of the animators until you know for sure it's actually gonna be in the movie. Only eight weeks have we turned this movie around, which is an incredibly short period of time to do it and an immense amount of work. Each screening becomes a little bit more nerve wracking. There's a little bit more pressure. We have less weeks to do it. What the screening process is, is we will screen the rough versions of these films which is done with uh, storyboards. And it feels like you're watching the real film, but you know, we're just seeing, you're seeing thousands of images, hand-drawn images go by that tell you how the story is progressing. And then after that screening, anyone in the theater can send us notes in terms of how they feel about the movie. But a smaller core group of people, about 40 people, will come into this room and we will spend three hours where people basically talk about what's working and not working. That it took tremendous strides in, in what you were focusing on, I thought. When we make a film, the number one thing that's important to me is the heart, the emotion within the, the movie. And to get that true emotion, the audience needs to really be engaged in in the journey of the main character. We did try starting the movie with Nick a couple times, and the problem we found with this particular movie in this world is that since we're presenting this as like this utopia that where everything's awesome and as soon as you know that something is messed up and every time we rescreen the film every every three months or so we actually completely reinvent the film yeah, i assume that's what the defiant one is it's not about like whether racism right or wrong because it's like that's a that you answer that in five minutes racism wrong there are a lot of people who do not like this process and they just they don't understand this idea that you bring a lot of people into a room a lot of people, really, a lot of people are going to look at my ideas and they're going to say what's good and bad. And I have to listen and then I got to go back and I got to rethink and I'm going to throw out. And so that's why it takes a certain type of personality to really want to participate in this type of environment, in this very, very collaborative where everybody gets to have thoughts. You know, and maybe I'm wrong, but I just, I, I see what the room thinks. I, I kind of like the idea of the prison system because I mean, like, you look at. Racism in the world, it's like in this room, we're all like, oh yeah, of course racism is terrible, but racism still exists. Like, we still live within a broken system. I think that that's what makes this world so great, is you've got these two characters who are learning to overcome that prejudice, and they are changing the world around them, but they do, it's not just the opinions of two people, it's the fact that they live in a broken system. But what I'm saying is a movie of one character says racism wrong, and one says racism is right, like, to me, that's not an, an argument. I think it's not one character saying racism is wrong, and one character saying racism is right. One character saying there is racism, and one character saying, what are you talking about? I don't see it. And that's the world today. Disney is the most collaborative place I've ever worked. It's, uh, it's really incredible. Um, to be here, and we really rely on each other to push on these films to make them better and better. But there's a, you know, 
if you take a step back and if racism is right there in front of the audience from day day one, we're not doing our job. That's what I'm saying. The challenge was how can you then make a light, funny, charming family film but still have this really deep um, theme and subject matter. The morning after Martin Luther King was killed, I, a child came into the room and said, uh, they shot a king last night, why did they shoot a king? I think children have to be told that this is wrong. And telling them they can turn you off. I wanted them to be involved in finding out what happened. I wanted them to know at least a little bit about how it feels to be stepped upon. We saw this documentary where a teacher had a group of kids, um, and she was talking about bias. The blue-eyed kids, she said, OK, you guys are going to wear collars. I'm going to put these little, little tiny little collars on you. And she gave them a bunch of rules where just very quickly, it was very clear it wasn't fair between these two groups. You know, an hour into this, they took a test. Just in that small amount of time, I think maybe it was the end of the day, in that small amount of time, the kids wearing the collars who were told they were lesser than, even though literally the teacher just made it up in front of them and told them this was just a game we're playing, the kids who had to wear the collars who were told they were lesser than didn't do as well in those tests immediately significantly worse. And the next day, the teacher said, OK, you know what? I made a mistake. It was actually the other way around. And the kids who had the collars on the day before were very obviously very happy to have those off. And the kids who had to wear the collars, who had experienced the same thing the day before, had to now, uh, they now didn't get to go out to the playground. And they didn't get the same snacks. And they couldn't do the same water breaks. And this movie where, where predators have been told, oh, you have to wear this collar, but it's really for you guys. Um, and how that would make them feel was really impactful to us. At the end of this documentary, uh, the teacher said, OK, we're going to take these little collars off. And um, one of the kids, uh, you can see in the documentary, um, rips this collar off and just starts trying to break it after he has it off. Like, it's very clear that something really deeply affected him in one day. And for us, you're, you're just watching this thing going, this is, this is just pretend. These are little kids, and this is just a pretend day of bias for them. How does that affect the entire world who's dealing with bias, where it's every day and a teacher can't say, OK, the, the game's over? The consequence is just a flat of prejudice about your prey. So that's the part that I'm still, and I think some, but someone may be able We want to make it feel like this is a, a modern day discussion. And so there's a very fine line to walk. And so going through, we want to make sure that those little things feel very much like something that we could experience right now. We've been working with this incredible expert on bias, Dr. Shaki Butler, and she's really been an important partner to us, really talking to us about bias and what it is and how it exists in today's world. Disney's role in creating culture is profound. Culture teaches you who you are, where your place is in the world, and a lot of it is implicit. So if I go to school, and I see all of the former presidents of the school or principals of the school, they're all white and they're all male. I'm learning about power. If you're going to create a society that's equitable, you can't do it without changing culture. And so when we shift culture and children can see themselves inside of a story and that they can play all different kinds of roles, it becomes that, that degree of flexibility is very important. Prejudice is something, of course, that everybody has. But where does prejudice come from? It comes from the ways that we're taught to be biased. And those two elements are linked together. And they're also linked to the larger system of inequity. I think that's one of the biggest things for us, is it's, it's not a specific group. It's not a specific race. It's not, it's not a gender. It's, it's none of those things. It's, Simply, it's two groups that do not get along, and one group that's feeling lesser than. And sort of how big of a problem is that? It's, it's a huge problem. How do you overcome it? It's, it's really, really difficult. And so for me, thinking about what are we trying to say is it really should feel universal. eaten anyone in thousands of years. But just to be extra safe, we have the tame caller. When a predator gets agitated, the tame caller reminds them to be good. So now all mammals can be together. In the beginning was this place that 
the Predator characters had to wear these collars that would uh, give them a shock if they, you know, if they had like bad thoughts or, um, or they became too emotional. And that's kind of what created the peace between the Predators and Prey. We kept working with it and working with it. And all of us would look at it and go, oh yeah, this is really clever, it's interesting and all like that. But, but there was something that kept just gnawing at all of us of seeing like, you know, we're, we're showing this beautiful world and we're showing it being kind of like unfair from the very beginning. It was really kind of tricky because we had to, we wanted that wonderful intro of Zootopia and we wanted an optimistic view of tame collars and our world, but in a way that's sort of an allegory. Thanks for making me the baby. I'm a grown mammal, Finnick Fox. It is degrading to my entire species. Relax, you're gonna buzz yourself. I am in a diaper! Oh. It was brought up earlier in story trust meetings and a lot of people brought up, you know, you could tell the story without the collars. I think that collars could be muddying things up. After every screening, it was really the first thing everybody kept talking about. And then we would kind of change it and rework it and stuff to soften it, to make it, and, and we kept, kept trying. And there were some great moments with that. There was a really emotional moment when a young mammal becomes of age, they got their collar on. And and the little kids would look at it saying, oh, I'm going to grow up. But the parents know there's a sadness to it of when they have to put this on their, their young child. Morris. Morris. <laughs> and it was always really emotional, that scene, and what we were, we were showing. So we felt like we had something going on. But it put us in a situation where, of course, the world is biased against animals like Nick, against predators. Prey animals don't like predators. It makes sense, but it was very obvious. Now, Pixar hadn't seen anything from Zootopia, nothing. We showed it to them. And the notes that we got back was so profound because it was, it was what I think all of us were feeling deep inside, but, but we just kept work, trying to work around it. But they gave us the cold, hard facts and truth about what we were doing. And they said, you know, I admire what you're trying to do here. You're trying to make us love this world of animals and make it seem fun, but from the get-go, I don't like the idea of collars, and it's preventing me from enjoying the movie. I want to love this world but because of the collars from the very beginning i hate this world you should rethink things so that make us love the world and then potentially see it get broken we had two screenings after that and getting rid of getting rid of this whole idea of shot callers on the predator characters, you know, and making everyone just equal, you know, in the city, um, and making it feel like a real city, you know, that that we all agree that's great. Do you know what I think? Let's hear it. I think you don't want me to prove I'm more than a bunny. Because if I do, you'd have to accept the fact that you could be more than a fox. We, as a group, Story Trust included, had all accepted that this movie was going to have collars. When we were up at Pixar and they talked about this idea, they said, what about using stereotypes instead? Like, you could still get the same thing. It's funny, my son knows animal stereotypes. And so when I tell him a bedtime story and a fox comes in, he goes, well, I know the fox is going to do something sneaky. So in a weird way, he already has the, the thing that the Nick character is going through. My seven-year-old is already thinking it. Just little hints I think we can push to be a little more. Um, well, again, it's, it's yeah. not the bias, it's the stereotype. It's a stereotype. Right. Yeah. She wants to be more than just a bunny. Right. Right. And that's why she's yeah. striving to be yeah. something that is just, bunnies just aren't meant to yeah. do that. And the, the dad says something like, like, honey, it's not, you know, it's essentially like the subtext is, I'm, it's not that I'm prejudiced, I'm just trying to be realistic. But, yeah. And Nick is, is, is basically, I'm exactly what everybody thinks I am. I'm a, I'm a clever, shifty fox. When you do a change like that, it ripples through like dozens to even maybe more than like a hundred scenes. So it's a huge impact. But the thing is that if we know if we make that change, then the movie itself will be stronger. It's, a, it's not something we do lightly. 
because it means that we have to throw out a lot of great work that's already been done. But the, uh, the benefit of it is that in the end, the movie will, uh, as a whole, be much, much stronger, and her character will be stronger for it. For this particular show, we understood that there was going to be a lot of animal characters, um, and we wanted to get a sense of what the fur was going to be like. So we've done a lot of research into understanding what what is fur like, how distinct animal fur is from character to character, and it's it's been a big challenge on this show. We've never done a movie that where all the characters were just furry animals, and to try to get the fur to resemble what they look like in real life on real life animals to get it to have the quality that real fur is supposed to have when light hits it when light passes through it we're getting into this kind of scientific nitty-gritty and then we'll pull back from all of that and say now how do we how do we translate that into something that's artistic and something that we can tune as an artist to make it look good and, and art directed and so on once we did get into screenings, um, one thing that people realized was how amazing the animal world is that we're trying to represent because we have everything from every mammal you can think of, you know, everything from elephants to mice, and we have this scale that's this incredible scale throughout the city where you have to figure out how these animals are going to live together. So we did a ton of research and we're really trying to make it feel like someplace when you look at the screen that you feel like you can step in to the screen and really, uh, really go there. The major challenge of the uh, show is creating a world that is recognizable to humans, but um, animals, animals look like animals designed it, basically. There's all these different habitats, and some of them are um, in the desert, some of them are in the tundra. Downtown is where all the animals meet, so you have um, multi-scale buildings, small doors, big doors, uh, um, transportation that can take different sizes, but we want to give it an animal twist, and so there's a, there's a, a, like a fine line you can wonder where it doesn't become comfortable for the audience anymore. And then the other thing that we've thought a lot about is, um, is how do animals, like how does an elephant cross the street with a mouse, you know, how, like what are the systems that you put together so that all these animals can like, especially through downtown, walk through downtown together. Our job is to create this universe that people don't question. We will be showing you scale in a way that you have not seen. This is different. You can literally be running down the street and all of a sudden you're in the world for a rodent. So you went from this place that an elephant could walk into the front door to a place where a three inch animal walks into the front door and everything has changed. And who are you shooting for and, and, who are the, and which perspective are you shooting from? Again, if you're shooting from a fox or if you're shooting from a rhino, it's a very different experience. And I, as much as I want to, as much as possible, want you to believe that you're there in that place. So the scale is definitely going to be a challenge all the way through this movie and not just because of the animals, but because of the universe scaling for the animals as well. It's not just art for art's sake. It's trying to bring you an emotion. It's trying to tell you a story. It's trying to involve you in these characters and these worlds. And something that I think no one's really ever tried before, which is trying to create this real metropolis that felt populated and genuine and believable, something you could actually step into. Right. So we're really trying to make something lasting and trying to connect with um, the deep parts of our souls that make us human beings. there was one suit store for all mammals well me and my boy have a plan we have a location and we have a dream all we need is a loan to make it happen it's not zootopia it's wild and sons zootopia need a suit zootopia welcomes you we had been telling the story through nick's point of view for the longest time for all six screenings and people you know believe that that that's the way to do it that's the way we should be doing it and it's very interesting when you have that as a concept that sometimes you continue to try and figure out how to make that work and that's what we did screening after screening we would sit within the story trust and talk about well let's make it work for nick what do we need to do and in each of those cases what we did was we kept giving nick more and more backstory so we could really empathize with him as a character and all that did was make the movie less and less fun we kept finding that it, the story kept getting darker and darker and darker, and people weren't connecting with the main characters as much as we wanted to. 
And so after a while we thought, okay, well, we really need to try something drastic to see if we can shift the movie to make it really land emotionally. Watching the second act, like going through it, it, it really felt like it's about a guy who doesn't want to go to jail. Or something. Right. No, right. Yeah. Yeah. And then one funny. which we've talked about a lot, which is, is Nick really the protagonist of this film? Is he, is he the right character to be following? And we've had this conversation many times where people said, I, I really understand who Hops is. Which I still think we have a, an issue with it, that it, Hops is the one that seems to change the most. But then it occurred to us, well, like, what if we try to tell the story through Hops' eyes instead? Because one thing that uh, had always been the case was that people always got Hops very quickly. So we broke it down, broke the movie down to the studs. And when we really went back and said, whose movie is this? Can it be Hops's? Is it Nick's? Is that too much? And then as we pushed forward, we then went to the version of, well, maybe it's Hops and she has, she's the main character. And the first version we thought of her was she truly is not biased. She doesn't see it and comes to see that bias exists in the world. But that didn't really feel like modern day. Most of us know that bias exists. And then we started pushing into, well, maybe she is dealing with her own issues of people putting her in a box. And then you bring in a little of that underneath it, she has some issues of her own to work through. And that started feeling really contemporary and started feeling like something that I think many people can relate to. Underestimating me, you'll find, is a big mistake. I am without limits. I'm limitless. We've spent now many, many weeks figuring out how to get rid of the collars, how to make the city feel more positive, how to make Hops the protagonist, and that was all massive shifts. But now we have this problem of time. The crew, who has been waiting for us to get these story issues worked out, needs time to finish the film. The interesting thing is always at this moment in time as a producer, you're nervous. Because irrespective of making a big change in the story at this moment in time, you always have this pressure of trying to make sure it's all going to get figured out at the right moment in time. And you can't make that happen. You can't say to people, be creative today and solve this problem. It has to happen in an organic way. But you also have to shepherd it in a way that makes it happen. There's kind of that balance between those two ideas. So I always look at it and feel like this is the part of the production that has the most stress points because you've now put stuff into production and you have to keep feeding the team more work and more work. Oh, that went so fast. I didn't get a chance to mention you or say anything about how we... Oh, I think you said plenty. What do you mean? The one part that we've been really focusing on in the Neck and Hops relationship over the last couple months is their breakup scene. Well, there's a point in the movie where uh, our two main characters, Nick and Hops, um, have an argument. She kind of becomes aware through Nick that she, at the core of who she is, there's a bit of her that believes that uh, predators like Nick are, are dangerous. And it really hurts Nick that um, this animal, this mammal that he's come to trust over the last couple days, who he's gotten very close to, would think that he could possibly be uh, a dangerous uh, mammal, a bad mammal. This assumption she makes um, splits the city destroys her relationship with Nick, um, and also makes her look at herself differently. We have worked this scene over and over again, and we looked at a version of it here in the building with our edit editing staff, and it didn't work. The timing of the plot is forcing things in. That's why I don't think any of us is feeling. We're calling it out too soon about right. what's going on. You've got most of the events. I was already on Nick's side going, oh, this is going to be bad. Me either. She needs to I judge just think you. have to track your choices. Separating the audience from your protagonist. And I lost the whole thing that we like when I talked about. Like, I don't feel yeah. their break. Like I, guess, yeah. I had right. it right. And then we went through it again. We went through it again. And each time we would polish it a little bit tighter. We actually wrote the scene as a group. We got everyone together so that everyone's on the same page, that everyone understands exactly what the emotional beats have to be. The issue with this breakup scene is that this is the critical moment in Nick and Hop's relationship. It's also the moment that the film, as, uh, as a piece to communicate with your audience, has to speak the most clearly. And since the movie is about bias, it's where we have to be the most surgical and precise about what we're saying. And the big 
thing that, which was so important, the character should have to make a choice. And then she gets up on stage and she has to make a choice, looking at Nick, do I do what Nick has said to me or do I do what I think is in my heart right? We got everyone together so that everyone's on the same page, that everyone understands exactly what the emotional beats have to be. And then from that point, once we have that landed, we'll get the performance from Jennifer and Jason. These predators may be reverting back to their primitive, savage ways. Are you serious? I just stated the facts of the case. I mean, it's not like a bunny could go savage. No, but a fox could, right? Nick, stop it. You're not like There's them. There's a them now. You know what I mean. You're not that kind of predator. And once we get that truly emotional performance that feels great to everyone, it'll go through editorial, and then we'll carry it forward into the animators. And uh, then their job will be um, to really use everything that they possibly have in their toolbox to make that scene feel real and genuine and deep. Because as fun as the movie is, uh, and as much of a romp as it is, it has this very, very deep core about something that's very serious and very insidious and can be very, very subtle. I mean, it's not like a bunny could go savage. Right, but a fox could, huh? Nick, stop it. You're not like them. Oh, there's a them now. After struggling with this breakup scene for months, we screened it today, this new version of it for John Laster and the Story Trust, and everyone bought into this is the right version. This is the final piece of the puzzle that makes this whole story complete. And now what we have to do is just take this movie to the finish line. I feel like I grew up uh, fairly privileged. I'm from a sort of a middle-class white family and you know I grew up in the outskirts of Philadelphia and stuff and you know my dad was sort of middle income and we you know I never really wanted for anything in my life you know I'm a uh, I'm a gay man I'm married to my husband for um, 28 years and so I you know the, the film isn't necessarily about that but I think it's I think there's something about the fact that everybody wants to feel accepted everyone wants to feel supported for me personally um, you certainly look at the world through a different lens after telling a story like this. I always think of myself as a pretty open-minded person. Even with that, thinking about this story and look at your everyday life and what can I do better or how can I, maybe I'm looking at things the wrong way. Um, those are really important and um, thinking about how to have those conversations with my kids that I'm already starting to have now before the movies come out. But I think the process of the movies even changed how I talk to them about things and how I want them to hopefully perceive the world differently. Um, so that's been pretty huge. I think in my own family, when I look at my little boy and I see a very Asian face, um, I first and foremost want to instill that he should be proud of who he is, no matter what. You know, and because, you know, this world, <laughs> it's not easy to not be, to, to not be white. So as much kind of inner strength and inner confidence and, and belief that uh, he could do anything is what I want to instill. I hope this movie is part of that. I'd rather be working on something with a message with a good message, a strong message that I can stand behind um, and put my name, you know, I'd be proud to put my name in the credits of that kind of film. This year has gone incredibly fast. I mean, uh, the, the amount of changes we've made to the movie um, and um, the amount of uh, production, compressed uh, production uh, schedule that that has happened over the last year is pretty unbelievable. Um, we, we were developing and producing the movie at the same time, so it's been a wild ride. Storytelling is really hard. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do, and it takes a lot of pieces adding up exactly correctly for you to take any audience on any journey and have them buy into it. On this film, more than any other, it's been a very difficult story to nail down. We knew we were dealing with this important topic, and we needed it to be told in a very elegant way. It needed to be something that you sort of evolved into. There's a responsibility. They don't have to all be enormous ideas, but there should be something very positive, optimistic, very hopeful in our storytelling that allows kids teenagers, adults, to relate to that story in a way that, say, that, that makes them think about something. 
I watched this team over the last six months really bring this movie to its conclusion. It's been a phenomenal thing to actually experience. And 550 people who created this film. And uh, it's 550 people who put a lot of love and what they're doing, and they make big sacrifices. And you just want them to know how much you care and how much you appreciate that they put into it every day.